hopefully we won't have to do this much more. So, all right. Well, Mr. Bronk, thank you for joining us. So Hi, Paige. We have an attendee. Oh, Eddie, okay. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. All right, uh, Mr. Bird, if you're set, um, we can I'm get set. You're all set, okay. Good evening, everyone. It is Wednesday, June 30th, 2021. It is 5.33 and we are here for the Long-Term Recovery Committee meeting. Um, we have with us this evening myself, Granit Hosky, Mr. Burt, um, Director Landry, Mayor Hedrick, Councilors Obrey, Bordelon, and Bumgardner. Um, from the Board of Ed, we have um, Mr. Kilpatrick, um, Mr. Knight, Director Fondoulis, Moderator Eben, um, from the City Planning Department, uh, Ms. Patrick, and from our Planning Department, Mr. Bronk. And I think I've got everybody. I apologize if I missed anyone. I think that's everybody. So. Did I hear Andrea? Uh, Dr. Ackerman? Yeah. I apologize. Yes, thank you so much. Is, is, is Mr. Piazza? Uh, Mr. Mr. Kilpatrick reported that he had an emergency and they're going to start the presentation on behalf of um, Chairperson Watson. And then if he can arrive in time, then he'll jump on the call with us. Okay, so we have a quorum. Um, approval of minutes 2021 450 March 24th 2021 special meeting minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Hedrick. Moved by Hedrick. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Second by Evan. And I, I had one comment. I was <laughs> minor. I'm sorry. Were you, were you seconding moderator Evan? I seconded it, and then I, I um, had just one comment on them. Certainly. Go go ahead. Uh, I just noted that my that I was referred to as Ms. Evan, and I would just prefer moderator or doctor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank okay. you. Um, anyone else have comments or discussion on the minutes? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor of approval of the minutes of March 24th, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved unanimously. So we are on to new business. And um, the first item we have this evening is 2021-512 Board of Ed American Rescue Plan funding update. Um, so, uh, Dr. Ackerman, I'll turn it over to you, and then you can um, hand it off to Mr. Kilpatrick and Mr. Knight as you see fit. Well, then, I see fit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I would say Mr. Knight, I think, don't you? Mr. Knight? Yes, I... Um... I, I wasn't aware that uh, uh, Dr. Piazza wasn't going to be with us uh, this evening. So I do not have his presentation um, um, to, to go over. Um, oh, he, he just arrived. I'm oh, great. Him. Very good. Good, 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 good. Thank you. Saved by the bell. <laughs> I, I knew his presentation. <laughs> we had it covered. All right. Hello. Mr. Piazza. Hello, thank you for joining us, Sarah. We, you just came in um, under new business. We approved the minutes of the last meeting and we are on 2021-512 Board of Ed American Rescue Plan funding update. And I had just turned it over to Dr. Ackerman and they were just about to begin. So you saved you saved everyone by showing up. So thank you so much. Oh, I, I apologize. I had to pick up my family at the airport and of course they were stuck on the tarmac for an extra hour that I did not count on. So. Sorry for being late. Oh, no problem. You made it just in time. Thank you, sir. So did you want me to go through the whole presentation? Um, we, we've we all had a chance. We received it right. in advance. And thank you so much for doing yeah. that. And I think we've all had a chance to take a look at it. So if you just want to hit the highlights, the key points, um, that would be great. And then we can open it up if people have questions. OK. Yeah, I think um, just uh, looking, I mean, the key points, obviously, um, are that this is advisory group that we put together is made up of um, members of the entire community, um, which obviously is, was an important step. We have teachers, we have parents, um, school administration, district administration, and, um, and board of ed. Um, and, and obviously the key component is, is that we want safe, the kids to be safely returned to in-person learning. Um, 
you know, the plan next year is to move everyone back to, to that and only have the uh, distance learning component available if a quarantine is necessary. We do have to plan for that uh, contingency um, um, still. And obviously uh, we would use distance learning um, if school was to be closed for any kind of emergency, whether it's, uh, you know, weather related, um, snow days, that sort of thing. We can still continue to use that, um, you know, at our disposal, um, which will be especially uh, good this, this next coming year because we are starting a little bit later uh, to accommodate the, the two new elementary schools that will be opening. Um, so right now, our, our last school day uh, for next year is, is June 17th, I believe. So we don't want to go too deep into, into June. And to help avoid that, you know, we will still maintain that distance learning um, for snow days with the occasional, of course, it's, a, it's the superintendent's discretion to, to grant a snow day um, if she'd like. Um, so, the, so the big priorities the, and, and the, the key to the committee that day um, and a key part of the presentation is just to understand where these ARP ESSER funds are going. Um, and there was a slide there that talks about the state level priorities and we keep referring to them as the five buckets of, um, you know, where the, where the money is going in. Um, obviously we wanna focus on the learning acceleration and academic, you know, getting back into school and, and moving things forward. Um, the family and community connection, uh, you know, we focused a lot on that and how that was one of the silver linings to all of this was that, you know, teachers and parents worked cl very closely together. Um, in some instances, especially with our younger students, uh, parents were sitting right next to their child, uh, which obviously they wouldn't get to do in normal circumstances. So they really got to see our, our, our teachers uh, firsthand. Um, so we want to maintain that connection and that tie, you know, as we uh, return to, um, in-person learning. Oh, another key part that I know is, is the one that's probably talked about the most is the social, emotional, mental health of students and staff. Um, we do realize that uh, they've been through a lot. Everybody's been through a lot. Teachers have been through a lot. Um, and to just uh, and to come back and, ex and expect everybody just to sort of not miss a beat um, wouldn't be prudent. So um, we have put, you know, definitely already put some fun towards our, our mental health specialists, our counselors, our school psychologists, our school social workers. Um, and we, we really want to maintain that because we know it's going to be important uh, for our kids and for our, our staff. Um, another bucket is in technology and professional development. Um, again, uh, another silver lining, if you will, was, was the growth of teachers in terms of their ability to use different, different technologies. And we will continue to use a lot of those. Uh, we've done a, um, we've started an analysis um, through a survey with teachers as to what programs that they've been using, which ones they found beneficial, which they'd like to continue to use. Um, and we are going to make some budgetary decisions based on that um, as well to see what we want to maintain. And then of course, continue the professional development for teachers so they can really use these technologies to their, to their fullest extent. Um, and then finally, the safe and healthy schools. Um, you know, I, I know uh, Sam Kilpatrick is here and, and his, his crew did an outstanding job, you know, keeping the, the, the building safe and uh, clean. And we, we're gonna continue to do that because we think that's an important um, part of this whole process and keeping kids safe and keeping kids healthy. Um, there was a slide in there uh, that showed you how the ESSER um, one and two funds were used. Um, it broke it down by percentage and um, the slide, you know, obviously we, we just did um, a 20% split of the, in those five buckets for these new funds that we're going to be getting. Um, obviously, that those will change uh, based on needs, but it does show you how things were used in the past. Um, and, and you know, you've probably um, heard uh, the superintendent and a lot of her uh, talks on this subject use the term uh, "back to better than normal." Uh, we don't want to just go back to normal because we realize things are going to be uh, different and, and we can improve in some ways. So we want to really try to transform what we're doing. Uh, like I said, we've been really surveying, you know, parents, students, and teachers as to what went well um, and what we want to continue doing and how we want to continue to grow, even though we're, we're getting kids back to in-person. So we'll continue to analyze those results and use those to make these, you know, the decisions that we're going to make um, uh, with these funds. Um, you know, and so that's really the, the quick, you know, summary of, of what you saw in that presentation that you looked over. 
Uh, the key component that I think people were really looking for is, is what we're doing for learning and we are bringing kids back into the building. Um, another question that has come up um, that's part of the uh, state form that we've posted, that was the, uh, the, uh, uh, the paperwork that says safe return to in-person learning um, was whether or not we're going to require to wear masks and, 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 and distance. And basically um, the terminology we used is that um, we will not do that unless it's deemed necessary by the state health department. So, so um, I think people understand that things can change. Things are trending in a positive direction. Uh, we hope that will continue. And as long as that does, uh, we won't have to do those things. Or we won't have to require those things. And we're hoping that we won't have to do that. Uh, but obviously, depending on how that goes and what advice we get from the state health department and, and the ledge light uh, group, uh, we, we might have to make those decisions uh, as the school year gets closer. But that seems to be uh, one of the other concerns that we're, we're hearing from parents. And um, we've made them aware this report and this presentation was probably the first time they were made aware of our stance in terms of not requiring that unless we're, we're told to. So. Uh, Hope that clarifies. I'm sorry if I spoke <laughs> too fast, but um, otherwise the documents are pretty pretty clear, I think. Thank you so much. Dr. Ackerman, did you want to add anything before I open it up for um, questions from the group? No, I think that I think that Dr. Piazza covered everything. I, I, I think I think one of the big things is uh, everybody is is uh, concerned about mask wearing. And I think our, our approach to what we have to do is practical and uh, really the only one that's that's available to us. So if things change, we'll keep everybody apprised. Thank you so much. Um, I didn't make introductions earlier, I apologize. Um, we have Mr. Bird is the town manager. I'm not sure who you've met before. So um, Dr. Piazza, um, John Bird is the town manager. Uh, Keith Hedrick is the city of Groton mayor. Um, he has with him Sierra Patrick, who is from his planning and development services. Mr. Bronk has, uh, Mr. Bird has Mr. Bronk from his planning and development services. Uh, moderator Eben is from our RTM, which is our financial body, and Councilors Obrey, Bordelon, Bumgardner, and myself represent the town council. Who did I miss? Director Landry, finance director Landry for the town. So I think you know everyone now. So um, does nice anyone... anyone... I'm sorry? I said I have met some of you, but it, it is oh. nice to see you all again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, does anyone have questions for Dr. Piazza? I know, Mayor Hedrick, you were um, asking or discussing some things. Um, offline regarding um, what the board might be doing. So did you have a specific question you wanted to ask? Uh, well, no, because I think you guys are coming to the council meeting on Tuesday night. And I think uh, superintendent's coming. So I was coming to, to give a brief so that we can talk about the uh, <clears throat> educational programs that we're gonna expand over in Brantford Manor and Groton Estates that, that uh, we have talked about offline that I want to get established over there so we can expand those programs and educational programs and those kinds of things. So uh, that's one of the things that I'm looking at is with, uh, with this money is expanding the programs in the areas where we have a need for it so that we could uh, uh, reinforce the education and provide additional education to those those populations that need it. So, yeah, and I think we spoke briefly at the uh, middle school. Um, we, yes, sir. Ceremony, and I know that that um, Susan Austin was was very in support of that and was looking forward to having those conversations and seeing what we can do for those communities. Definitely, absolutely. Thank you. So Mayor Hedrick, your um, city council meeting will be Tuesday evening and Dr. Piazza will be at that meeting. Uh, somebody's gonna be at that meeting. Okay. I, yeah, I, I think Sue was, was going to attend and, and I probably will as well. Okay. okay. It's just, it's unusual because your meetings are normally on Monday night. So I just wanted hey, the public, hey. if anybody's watching at home, that way they understood. Right, because, because of the holiday and it actually has been official because typically the superintendent is at a board of ed meeting on Mondays. So there was a conflict there, but we were able to work it out so that on Tuesday they can come and we can start the presentation with the council 
and get the council involved in this and and uh, get feedback from the council and then start start moving forward with this initiative. Thank you. I just wanted to also note that um, uh, State Representative Christine Conley has joined us. Thank you, Representative Conley, for joining us. We are on um, the first item, uh, Board of Ed American Rescue Plan funding update, and Dr. Piazza just gave us a brief overview. Councilor Bordelon, you have a question. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much for your um, your your presentation, and I um, I think it's very helpful, you know, to make sure that we're able to talk about these things. I know we some things were stated tonight that. Um, certain areas will be identified, um, but children outside of those areas and children that are already identified as having um, not meeting and closing those achievement gaps in uh, not only the minority communities, but low income communities, as well as children who speak English or, or another language as, a, as, as their first language. Um, they're, a lot of those students have been identified as having trouble and not having help at home to propel um, that schoolwork. Um, so my concerns lie mainly in making sure that these resources and enrichment programs are gonna happen um, in-house and making sure more of the remedial support services are available as well as what tools will we be using to test students really? to identify them early on Let to make sure that no student, I'm sorry. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, I just heard someone else say something. I didn't want to interrupt them. I guess it was Councilor Overy leaving. I, I think uh, somebody's mic was on, that's all. No, um, I just wanted to make sure that these students are not going to be underserved um, and what type of tools are we going to be using early on within the first month of school to test students and using the funds appropriately to make sure that we're identifying those achievement gaps. Um, you know, as a mother um, with a educator in the household, um, it is hard when you're working full time and students were propelling through this curriculum by, by themselves and parents were at work. Not everybody was able to sit next to their students and be home. And so a lot of children that were of age to be home alone had no help at home um, outside of the support from the classroom teacher who also was supporting multiple students um, at once. So I'm just curious to see how these funds will be used to make sure we're identifying um, and closing achievement gaps that have already been identified. We have some achievement gaps that were identified in multiple schools over many years. And um, I'm hoping um, that our town didn't suffer uh, drastically anymore um, from this, but they're finding that students have. And I just wanna make sure, especially our students who do not speak English as their primary language are also um, getting the intervention and services they need. Um, I know at the high school, there was at one point one uh, teacher to help students between the middle school and the high school. And I have expressed concerns with only one support um, for that large body of students. So I know at one point we were looking to hire. Is there anything in this budget that's going to um, look to hire more support for um, those students? Thank you. No, thank you. And you bring up concerns that I know the committee uh, did discuss. And I know that Iran, uh, um, the, the superintendent's uh, list in terms of um, wants and desires as well, in terms of the staffing that you mentioned. Um, I know that we have begun this summer with um, the, the use and hiring of tutors, um, with I, students who have been identified by their, by their buildings, by their specialists, in terms of those that we can um, help over the summer. Um, and the big work this summer that's being done is to um, look at the data that we do have, see what those gaps are, and they're really adjusting the, the curriculum to, to try to, um, to meet their needs right, right when we uh, return in September. Um, to identify priority standards and to sort of, you know, trim the fat a little bit in terms of um, those, you know, really focusing on what we we want, we need the kids to learn uh, without having to spend two, three months at it, you know, to, to make up the work from last year. So um, it's been amazing the number of staff that have, um, that have been working this summer, considering uh, we were concerned about, you know, the teacher, we wanted the teachers to get their rest as well. Um, but uh, right from the get-go, right from the week after graduation, we've been working hard because um, we do believe it, it is going to start with the curriculum and um, uh, and looking at that and seeing how we can prioritize things. But I do know um, the superintendents, one of the superintendent's priorities is having that staffing and having that support for our students, especially 
Um, it has been mentioned about the ELL um, supports as well. So I know that's that's definitely on our list of priorities. Thank you, Dr. Uh, thank you for your Thank you for your response. And um, my last question is um, to students who are did not fall by or take, take a hit due to this um, pandemic academically, um, making sure um, there are systems in place to make sure that students are not becoming bored and the advanced students are able to continue with the rigor needed um, within that classroom or structure. Um, so if there's a lot of repeating going on, you're gonna have other students that are gonna start to fall behind and become bored. So really having those sessions and classrooms break, you know, broken up in, in a way where students are able to support each other, but also there's some dynamic um, rigor, you know, rigor in, involved that would enhance uh, those students to propel forward even further. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have questions for um, Dr. Piazza? Okay, thank you so much. Um, we will go on now to the second item. Uh, which is a report from um, the town, American Rescue Plan discussion. I believe Mr. Bronk is gonna lead this discussion. At least or, that's what I've told Mr. Bronk. <laughs> and this is John, just as a preface, of course. Oh, sorry, let me turn that off. Spam call. <laughs> um, as a preface, of course, as uh, you know, the, it's going to be pretty complicated deciding which which items the uh, council will want to spend their funds on, what process to get there. We have to have processes in place to track funding and to into uh, grant applications, that whole thing. And and uh, planning department's been giving that some thought, and Paige is going to touch on that. Sure, I think I'll just jump right in. We're, we're still um, trying to consider what the best process is in moving forward. And uh, I apologize if, if I end up repeating some things that people already know, uh, but we, we've been participating in a number of webinars. Uh, we have read the 150 page uh, draft final rule provided by the federal government, trying to understand uh, how this funding can be spent uh, or I should say invested at the local level. And uh, I'd like to read the, the four main areas, uh, at least on the municipal side, uh, from the final rule. Uh, basically, uh, we have four general buckets. Number one, respond to the public health emergency or its negative economic impact, including assistance to households, small businesses, and nonprofits or aid to impacted industries such as tourism, travel, and hospitality. Number two, to respond to workers performing essential work during the COVID-19 public health emergency by providing premium pay to eligible workers. Number four, the provision of government services to the extent of the reduction in revenue due to the COVID-19 public health emergency relative to revenues collected in the most recent full fiscal year prior to the emergency. And four, make necessary investments in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure. Uh, I should say, um, when they talk about sewer, generally speaking, stormwater would be included in that. So you have four general buckets. And having read the, uh, the final rule, basically, they're enabling local governments to come up with creative projects that respond to anything that fall within these larger categories. I think the overall intent is not to be restrictive, but to find a way for local governments to comply and, and use this money in the best way possible. However, there are, there are uh, explicit um, uses that are, that are not allowed. I'm not necessarily gonna cover those right now, but um, case in point one is you can't use it for pension reimbursements. And there are, there are other that are added to that list. Um, my take in listening to a lot of the webinars and understanding how we're best to approach this, there was one quote that was provided that, that's really made an impression on me. Um, and it's uh, a quote from the Brookings, Brookings Institute. It basically said, looking back over time, People will, this is a once in a lifetime situation for most local government. And looking back, people will evaluate which places merely spent the money, 
versus which places invested the money. And the, all of the education that we've been participating in is in the promoting high impact efforts uh, rather than a large number of smaller initiatives. Um, this is an opportunity for Broughton to take this funding and actually ad address their needs. Where are the greatest needs and try to make um, basically uh, catapult us forward, taking a horrible situation we've experienced and turn it into an opportunity. Um, they have stressed often the need, um, the treasury has emphasized this and many of the training sessions to conduct a needs assessment. And they don't necessarily advise how to do that. Uh, I suppose it could be done by a committee such as this. It could be done through standard means where we have a number of meetings. And I believe um, the, the, the school department has, has talked about the effort, how they've, they've begun to address their needs. There could be surveys. There could be you know traditional means uh, using Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. But there needs to be some mechanism to address our needs so that we know we can defend these priorities moving forward. Um, we actually have an idea, but I'll, I'll, I'll hold on, on that until a little bit um, later. Um, I, I think it's also important to realize that the funding from the American Rescue Plan, um, there are multiple tiers. Some of it is going to, let's say, housing already. Some of it's going to schools already. The state has their own cutout and we're getting our fraction technically under what's called the Coronavirus State and Local Recovery Fund partition of a larger fund. So I think what's important is understanding what is available and matching that with our needs moving forward so that we're not necessarily duplicating efforts that are being done being done elsewhere, um, you know, we're trying, trying to find out statewide, how are they addressing some of the existing social needs? Case in point, we've learned, for example, uh, evictions. Um, Unite Connecticut has some funding for that, dealing with rentals. And I think they also deal with electric assistance. Not to say that we can't add to that, but the state is charged with a certain carve out for dealing with some of these housing needs. Also, um, CHAFA, the Connecticut Housing Finance Agency, they're being given funding um, that will deal with foreclosures. It's my understanding that program's yet to be established, but they are getting a significant dollar amount to deal with that. Um, but no doubt, those are local needs for us as well. So we need to balance out what's being done directly by the state versus what our needs are locally. Um, I think. We're honestly, we're quite concerned about how we're gonna conduct prioritization and, and the needs. And we're hearing it, everyone's hearing it. Staff, I'm sure everyone on this Zoom call right now is hearing about these priority needs, but how do we really conduct uh, a defensible needs assessment? And one thing that we have stumbled on uh, recently, and, and it's something that I think should be considered, but we also understand time is, is of the essence. There are a number of platforms that are being used, community assessment platforms, and these are being done nationwide. They, they have come up through a lot of the uh, ARPA discussions and the cost to do this could be paid for with the ARPA money. Uh, basically, it's the ability to try to bring everyone together in a digital form to allow them to engage on what they believe the priorities are. And it's also an opportunity to push information out and data and to tabulate it in real time. It can be done by category, subject matter, neighborhood, mapping can be involved. And if you think about some of the projects we've been dealing with over the past few years, um, there clearly is a need for us to try to get more input but in real time so we can, we can know what the majority needs are rather than simply um, 
people that might be in the inner circle or, or the vocal minority. Um, so one of the programs that, that the software we're looking at, it's called Citizen Lab. And if people are interested, we're more than happy to uh, share what we know. There are other platforms as well, but that's the one that seems to be um, catching on in a lot of communities. However we do it, we need to find out the best way to prioritize our, our needs. And um, we actually are, are warm to using a platform like that, but, but would defer to the town as a whole. Um, I think those are my general comments at this point in time. Um, concern for how we're gonna prioritize, document, get the input from the public, and ensure we stay within the boxes um, for this funding we, we have. Uh, obviously, there'll be self-reporting, uh, given that we're a non-entitlement community. And if we should make a mistake and actually fund a project that is not eligible, ultimately, the town will be responsible for paying those funds back. Um, so we have to be cautious uh, while we move forward and, and try to address people's needs and, and a quick manner. Thank you, Mr. Brock. Mr. Burt, did you want to add anything? Uh, nothing really to add other than I completely agree with them on the need to, uh, for us all to provide the best information to the council as possible so that they feel comfortable where they're allocating the dollars. So the, the program that, um, Mr. Bronk mentioned Citizen Lab. Can you just talk to us briefly about what that is and how it would be used in Groton? You're muted, Mr. Bronk. <laughs> Sorry about that. That is one particular company. Uh, as I said, there are others. Um, I'm looking for a sheet of paper, which I don't have in my hands at the moment, but. Basically, um, it is a platform that the public would be asked to engage in. We would also use this platform to push information out. Um, it would allow for larger scale surveys, smaller scale surveys. There could be hypothetical analyses, someone could put a project out there and say, um, well, let, let's, let, let's, um, let's talk about maybe the, the school effort. I heard mentioned to tutoring and I've, I've learned that that is certainly eligible. That is something that many communities are doing. You could put a quick survey out there asking parents, how many believe that they would make use of tutoring? How many parents have children that would really benefit from such tutoring. And, and I know we're getting information from meetings and emails, et cetera, but this would be a community-wide broad-based platform that we would actually have statistics from. And we could track the comments rather than getting them individually through Facebook and Twitter and email, et cetera. We could actually track all the comments, all the input and Come up with reports. We could do it by neighborhood. We could do it. Uh, we could share mapping. We could share ideas through this main community platform. Um, I'm, I'm probably not giving it full service. I, I am. Uh, we've been looking at it and have more information. I'm more than happy to send it out by email to the committee so that they could learn more about it. Um, but that's the general. That's the general um, use of the tool. The tool is uh, less than $20,000 for basically full platform use. You can run multiple projects, multiple scenarios. And in reality, it, it could help us, I think, even beyond how we use the ARPA money. It, it could very much be a new platform that um, enables more community engagement. I have one more question, then moderator Evan um, has her hand up as well. So regarding this, um, the software, the public engagement software citizen lab, would that be something that um, staff, your staff would use 
to gather information, then you would feed it to the policymakers in town, and then the policymakers would be the ones that would determine, you know, if we wanted to take care of that or this item or perhaps even something different. I'm not just quite sure how it would mesh with um, how our government's structured. It, it definitely would feed up to decision makers. In addition, it's my understanding um, it would be more real time in that the public would have access to the data as well. So um, it's probably uh, far more transparent than anything we've used in the past. Um, but, but indeed, if it's, it's, it's the question means, is it just for staff's use? No, it's definitely intended to be um, a solicitation of, of the public opinion. And that information would directly be available to decision makers. Thank you. We have quite a few hands. Moderator Evan, you have the floor first. You're muted. Thank you again. Um, <laughs> I, I did have a few questions. Um, I don't know much about citizen law, but I am a social scientist. Um, and, you know, from what I hear, you would not have statistical data because you would only have information regarding the people who self, um, basically self-selected to take the survey, which means that they would have a computer, they would have internet, and they would be tied in to whatever your method of disseminating that information is. So, um, you know, I, I don't, you know, from as a social scientist, I, I don't think it would necessarily be better than what you get on Facebook. It would just be maybe in one place, so it might be easier to access, but I don't necessarily think it would give you um, better information about what the citizens would like. Um, so I just wanted to have that caveat there because what I heard was not a statistically valid model um, or statistically valid sampling. It was just a platform that people could choose to complete a survey or not. Is that correct? That's correct. And I think it's, um, if I painted the picture that this is a survey tool, I'm sorry, that's not exactly what it is. I actually found the paper I was looking for. If I could read a couple more sentences, I think it might clarify. Uh, and, and then I'll come back to your comment. Uh, it's a modern cross-platform interface with several methods to engage, including map-based tools, polls and surveys, participatory budget tools, message boards, and online workshops. It has the ability to create focused breakout groups. The platform lets you engage specific subsets of residents based on their neighborhood, group affiliation, case in point like store, store owners, even people um, with their own virtual spaces to collect more granular feedback. This feature would allow the team to take an equity focused approach, remove the loudest voices in a room and engage more deeply with specific communities within Groton that are traditionally underheard in planning and decision-making processes. Um, it would, it would offer easy collaboration with the town, the city, and neighborhood stakeholders on outreach, messaging, and engagement. And the platform acts as a behind the scenes project management tool that allows for multiple stakeholders to create, moderate, and analyze engagement projects, making it easy to collaborate throughout a project and share learnings between departments and organizations. So I think that best captures it. But, but, yeah, but I, I have to just say that what you've said doesn't give me any hope that it's, you know, I, it, I, I would feel better if you actually had a consultant who was going to develop a survey that would hit those hard to reach neighborhoods. I don't understand how this is going to do that. It's only as good as the people who are soliciting that information and getting to those people who may or may not have Wi-Fi, who may or may not have access to a computer. You know, right now the library is probably one of the best places, the most egalitarian places in Groton for allowing everyone to access Wi-Fi and computers and printers. So um, I don't, to my mind, it's like a nifty thing. <laughs> and uh, it, but I don't think it's necessarily gonna deliver the uh, sales blurb that you just read. Okay, I understand. And certainly um, Groton could do traditional surveying if that's what they want for a statistically valid survey. Um, but anyway, it's a tool and more than happy to share it for those who are interested in learning more. Thank you, Mr. Brock. Moderator Evan, are you sad I have other 
Yeah, I'm fine. I, I was just had one other question, which was just when um, Mr. Bronx said the word, he, they were warm on it. I wasn't quite clear what you meant. I just apologize. If you said you were warm on that tool. Does that mean good or bad or indifferent? Oh, we definitely like it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Great. Um, I saw Councilor Overy next, please. And you're muted as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering in these buckets, um, I probably haven't read enough, so I apologize if I'm asking a question that can't be answered, but can we do um, extension of services uh, with this money that would open perhaps a commercial area or, or a housing area or growth for Groton? Uh, I'm talking about water lines, sewer lines, et cetera. You know, if we could, do, if any of this can be applied to that type of project? Um, infrastructure specific to water, sewer, stormwater, and broadband, definitely yes. It would have to be appropriately documented. Um, in terms of housing, uh, that is possible. Um, there was one other you, you had one other concept, I think, in the question that was in the beginning, and I'm, that one. Commercial, uh, com opening up, in, I'm sorry, industrial areas. I'm not sure about that one. Certainly, we can help existing businesses, um, most particularly help them in where they have experienced uh, a, a, a detrimental impact as a result of COVID. Uh, we can also help them pivot. What I mean by that is um, if they're looking to do better in the future um, so that they're not vulnerable to um, a COVID type situation or scenario, we can help them with that. Whether we can open up and, and have a fund for new business or new industrial areas, that one um, I'm not 100% positive. I was, I'm still kind of looking at, not necessarily, but if we could use the money to extend water and sewer, then those things would happen. It's just, it would open up some different housing area where houses could be built. It would open up an industrial area because it would have facilities. You know, it would, it would bring about other things if we could make it so that more of Groton had water and sewer. So I, Definitely. Um, infrastructure is one of the four buckets, and it, it's quite clear that those are allowed. And, and some of the some of the webinars I've been on, they, they start to give their opinions on how much of an allocation in terms of percentage you should uh, provide towards infrastructure. Many of them have had a fairly high percentage uh some are as high as 50 percent of the allocation clearly it's a local decision but in terms of making large impacts over time infrastructure certainly do that thank you thank you um i have representative conley next thank you madam mayor i just had um, a couple things. I appreciate all the, the good thoughtfulness that this group in the presentation um, has us to do. And isn't it nice to talk about what to do with money instead of the usual <laughs> um, meetings that we've had on how can we save, you know, cut services because we're lacking money. But a couple things I just wanted to um, highlight is with this money, I, there is a lot of talk and there's a lot of need for recurring costs or in, pro programs that will, will have an annual cost. So do realize this is, I believe the money must be used within three years and you don't want to put yourself in a hole um, where when this comes out, you then have to be in the place that we've all been in canceling of programs. Um, so do be mindful as to how you spend the money for recurring programs so that you have that hole filled in or a plan to fill in that hole uh, in the future. And also take a look to fill in that hole, something I've, I've suggested to multiple towns is do take a look for what infrastructure projects qualify for ARPA funding that is on your CIP list. So you can get some of the, that future projects. You can't use this money to pay off debt, 
but you can use the money to um, pay for projects that you would have otherwise bonded or been in future budgets as uh, CIPs. So that can free up some money to do some of the long-term annual projects that I know many people, not only you guys want to do, but residents want to see. Um, and then just at the survey concept, you might not need a professional statistical survey. Uh, many folks, you know, you can go door to door at neighborhoods. We can all, everyone can volunteer and say, is there a need that you have and take notes and, and send it back. Um, there's things we can all do. And I know many folks have, have been on the doors or on the phones before and can do that again. I find oftentimes the people with the biggest needs are the ones that you do miss with the online surveys. Uh, people who are, are struggling the most don't have that 20 minutes to have, get to the place with active internet, log on, um, utilize the computer in a way that maybe some of us who have desk jobs and are sitting in front of a computer all day have the access to the internet. So please be mindful that, that sometimes we, when our tries to get good statistics is we're missing our residents who um, do need to have their voices heard the most. And now that we can be in person right now, maybe things like, I know the city's doing uh, meetings with the officers, maybe that's something the town could think about doing along, you know, how would you want to spend the ARPA money um, so that folks who have needs, we know all about it. So we can best use those good funds and appreciate the federal government. Hopefully we get a little bit more in the next upcoming months. Um, so, but we can make some long-term changes to really benefit not only the residents, but to benefit the town and the city as we move forward. And maybe maybe more Wi-Fi, so it's not just driving to the library, would be a really good idea so that people have access to the internet, access to jobs. Um, and we all know what happens when, when our Comcast or Thames Valley goes down and we're trying to, to be on the Zooms all day. So thanks, guys. Thank you. Um, I have Councilor Baumgartner next. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, thank you, Paige, for the presentation, as well as um, uh, Dr. Piazza. Um, welcome to um, Groton, and um, look forward to working with you in the future. Um, I know in meetings past, we've talked about how, you know, we can really best leverage these funds, um, you know, in working in co close collaboration amongst uh, all entities, you know, uh, you know, obviously, a municipality that has uh, subdivisions, um, and a you know, a board of education that serves um, not just students within uh, our community, but also some of the surrounding communities as well. So, you know, really um, partnering to identify, you know, where those needs are. Um, you, Paige, you had mentioned um, doing sort of having a, a needs offensive, uh, a needs assessment that is uh, defensible. Uh, and, a, and so, you know, the, I think the points that moderator Eben brought up of having you know statistically valid um, surveys done to ensure that you know we are getting um, a truly a cross section of our community providing input uh, as to how we are spending uh, really millions of dollars uh, for the years to come. Um, you know it's certainly promising to hear that we're going to be focusing on key areas in the city, uh, but also know that there um, you know in, in many respects in our community. Um, you know, poverty may not be confined to, um, you know, just cer certainly one neighborhood. Um, a lack of internet access may not be confined to one neighborhood. Perhaps uh, there is a home, uh, you know, that um, is not properly served because they do not have the financial resources that many of their surrounding neighbors uh, do. Uh, that's obviously what we saw with this pandemic, uh, is that there are many families who, um, who are uh, struggling uh, now more than ever. Uh, and so what can we do now to not just obviously provide um, a helping hand in the uh, interim in the time being, but uh, for the years to come? I think it was mentioned today um, with the Board of Education's moniker being, um, you know, returning to better than normal, um, which I, I think is a great um, kind of um, call to action really for all of us. Um, so one question I have is probably uh, would be best answered by our uh, wonderful director of Landry. Uh, with respect to how much money can the town directly spend? Uh, how much money is the Board of Education directly spending? I know we've heard $7 million um, uh, dollar amount of uh, uh, $7 million uh, for the Board of Education, I think 3.8 for the town. Um, you know, there are some questions as to whether or not the subdivisions will be receiving American Rescue P Plan funds uh, directly. We subsequently found out uh, that indeed they are uh, in some respects. So. 
Um, just can we get some sense of where we are in terms of total dollar amounts? And I think that would really help us, um, you know, uh, maybe narrow in our focus and identifying what some of those needs are. Um, and uh, just one quick point, I, uh, Representative Conley brought up some two very important points about, um, you know, being careful with starting programs uh, with recurring expense expenses in uh, future years. Um, that's awfully important, um, especially since that, uh, you know, there, there certainly are needs, but uh, are some of those needs uh, in the, um, you know, really wants. Um, and uh, certainly the CIP, just a quick aside, the CIP is really a living, breathing document. Uh, it's a policy document that really guides how uh, the town spends our dollars to improve um, amenities and uh, recreational, um, uh, our recreational infrastructure, our, you know, uh, uh, infrastructure to improve resiliency, protect our, um, uh, you know, our, uh, you know, uh, you know, so on and so forth. So um, uh, my question is um, sort of twofold, uh, the financial side of things, and then also uh, just any reaction to what I said. Thank you. <laughs> so Director Landry, I'm oh. not sure if you have the numbers that Councilor Baumgartner was um, requesting at your fingertips or not? If not, um, you could- This is, this is John. Um, oh, thank you. I've got some of it. Um, we did receive the first payment on the 22nd, which is the first 50%. Um, we received just under 4.3 million. So meaning uh, we'll get received another 4.293 million and change. Uh, so altogether about 8.6 million just under. The, uh, the city, I believe, is it about 2.6 million Mayor Hedrick, total for the city. It's 2.6 million and we received 1.3 last week. Right, Groton Long Point, um, we'll get a total of 75,000, I believe is what they're receiving. Um, I don't have that number from me, but I'm pretty sure. And then the Board of Ed, it was just slightly over 7 million, I believe, is that right? Um, I know it's right around we that. Had, uh, we had 6.8, but we had 3 million from the ESSER two as well. Okay. And I don't recall what, um, Councillor Baumgartner, what was your second question, sir? Yeah, so, you know, now that we have an understanding of what uh, each group will be receiving, you know, I think one thing we should talk about and before we kind of conduct the needs assessment with our community, gauging how those dollars are spent is, I think some shared, um, or at least some shared goals amongst this group as to how we can best leverage uh, each other's pool of funds to benefit all residents and to provide equity, um, you know, sort of in the process as well, uh, which I, I think, um, you know, has been a big focus of this, um, you know, of, of really President Biden's approach to the American Rescue Plan, you know, um, improving outcomes, you know, for, for all uh, economic and, and um, you know, the welfare of our, of our community. So, um, you know, with respect to resiliency as well, um, you know, it was mentioned with broadband internet. I mean, um, I don't know how many families I've spoken to who said, you know, we just did not have adequate in access to uh, the internet during uh, the pandemic if it weren't for uh, the Board of Education providing, you know, laptops and, um, you know, working with families to find, um, you know, a good internet providers, they would have really fallen through the cracks and, and some, some did. And so, you know, I think it's incumbent on us to really reflect on that and take some lessons from that. And, you know, um, as we're coming up with ideas or, or projects to fund, uh, really kind of, um, you know, not lose focus of that. Um, and, and to engage that, you know, those families in the process as well. Thank you. Um, I, I know we have another hand, but I just wanted to say that we also have um, our human services update today and we wanna make sure we get that before we do any more further discussion about things. And then uh, Mr. Burt will provide a COVID update. So uh, we need to make sure we talk to human services as well. Councilor, but, um, Councilor Bordelon, did you have another question? Um, this is my first time speaking on at this part, but I did have one previous question for Board of Ed uh, for Mr. Piazza, Piazza first. Um, I know pre-COVID, um, free, the free lunch program um, was uh, available to schools that qualified for Title I services. And then once COVID hit, there was funding to make district-wide uh, free lunch. And 
I was hoping that to hear that these funds would be used to continue to provide free lunch for all students in the town of Groton and moving beyond those funds to continue to have those available for our town in Groton because we realize the need to make sure children are not hungry in our town. That was my first question. Yeah, well, the good news is that, is that I, I believe it came from the state um, has agreed to pay for breakfast and lunch for all kids again for one additional year. Um, and then we can look at what, what comes after that, definitely with, the, with um, if we wanna continue that um, program, which has been, been beneficial with so many, but we do know it's locked in right. for another year. Perfect. So the, looking at those funds that we're talking about that seven you know, million, looking at the next two years after that, starting to talk about that around the table because certain sections of town really benefit from having free lunch for, for all and school districts that already have that in place um, did not have to budget for that. It was already something in their budget. So I'm hoping to see that as part of a long-term plan. Um, as far as the town side, looking at the money, um, I just had a question for uh, Mr. Bronk. How much is that uh, program that you had mentioned? How much, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. That software, that program that you felt warm about, the how, how, how much does that cost? Less than 20,000. I believe it was 18,000 and change. Yeah. So I, I agree with um, Representative Connolly and moderator uh, Evan. You know, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I've seen some studies come out. I know some studies were done for a needs assessment for um, like the Pratt building, for example. And you look at the numbers of people that actually took that and said, you know, what the direction we wanted to go. When you look at the whole town of 40 plus thousand people, that's like, like it was a very small percent. So I'm concerned that we may not meet all the needs of the folks. I also think it'd be important to have something like a public hearing um, to allow folks to come in and, and we can have a presentation and then have people know that we're gonna be talking about this and have them come up and say where they feel in this town things are needed. And then maybe some other um, like door knocking, like Chris Connolly said, hitting areas that were hardest hit, really looking to see how we make sure we're reaching all the needs of our town. I also agree um, that we do not want to, uh, we want to, imp imp you know, we want to make sure we're, we're starting programs and, and helping the needs of folks, but we don't want to start programs that we cannot fund on the backside later after the three years, and then we're looking to cut or extend programs that we can't afford. Um, I think infrastructure is another great avenue, but I also want to make sure that this money is here for the needs because of what happened, and I want to make sure it's actually directly impacting individuals. Um, and infrastructure is a, a piece of that, but I would love to see it really um, impact the lives of, of folks um, that more, more than likely normally aren't benefiting from programs like this in our town and expanding uh, programs like our youth center. We found that the need for students to have a place to go that was safe, clean, um, with activities, um, that uh, youth center that we set forth over there on the old Fitch Middle School, former high, Fitch High School, um, those are great infrastructure improvements in our town. I know there's folks speaking about athletics and our field needs in our town, um, looking at our walking park lights over there. Um, with COVID, we found people didn't have a safe place to walk once it got dark. Um, looking at the whole social, emotional, and physical well-being of our, our constituents in our town and having um, a place to exercise was a huge cry when gyms closed. So these are the things that I'm thinking about, but I definitely think it'd be important to really make sure we're putting out uh, information to bring around the table the people that it is impacting and having a, um, a public hearing on this matter and allowing folks to come forward to talk about where and what things are needed. Thank you. Ms. Patrick. Um, hi, I just wanted to make a quick comment about um, the community engagement tool. So the city of Brighton also kind of did a little bit of research um, for these tools. We were looking at co-urbanize. Now, I didn't, I didn't necessarily see this as a needs assessment tool, but just wanted to speak to the fact that as a community engagement tool for planning and local development, this type of platform um, is tremendous and it's it's a benefit to have and it will just be one tool in the matter of like how the community engage but I know we mentioned infrastructure resiliency and capital improvement um, plans this may be not appropriate for um, the needs assessment portion but as we move forward and continue to plan for Groton it should be something that we um, collectively consider both on the town and city side of how we can incorporate that tool um, to help staff and, and collaborate with community members. 
Thank you so much. And I, I enjoy hearing the collaboration aspect. So thank you so much for that. Um, we have um, agenda item 4.3, 2021 513 human services update. And I'd like to turn it over to Director Fondoulis at this point. Thank you, Director Fondoulis, for being here this evening. Thank you for having me. Um, I did um, send out via John uh, this morning um, um, a brief overview of, of where things stand in human services. I've been sort of waiting for my marching orders, so to speak, as far as use of any um, funds um, above and beyond what we already offer in our department. And I tried to spell out those various programs and, and services that we already provide. And we're quite used to in the department um, utilizing a variety of sources of funding to help people with their, their needs. And um, should there be any monies coming forward to help with the um, assistance to households as identified by the Treasury Department um, in rent and utilities and um, um, food and um, such things as childcare expenses or job training, et cetera. Um, we would certainly be ready to implement um, the, the structure of such a, a program to help people using some of these funds. Um, but I, I really need, as I say, my marching orders from the town as to what, uh, what it wants the department to do in this regard. Um, but we're ready to, to jump in um, and establish um, guidelines for assistance to families, households in need um, as soon as, as um, we're asked to do so. Um, so that's basically it in a nutshell. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of waiting and seeing what is, um, what is possible as far as any funding coming to um, those households that we'd be assisting in the department. Very good. Thank you. Yes. I wasn't sure. I thought I heard someone else speaking. Um, Mr. Burt, did you want to jump in on anything that Director Fondoulis has said? Uh, no, other than I think it is a great resource for any programs we look at for helping uh, households directly. I think uh, there's a lot of uh, help that her department could provide. And I'm interested, uh, uh, Marge, as you hear things from any clients about needs, you know, you know, I know it'd be anecdotal, but I still like to hear what you're hearing, you know, with boots on the ground for the needs. Well, it, it's primarily those the, the 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 main three items. It's food, it's utility bills, it's it's rent assistance, um, and um, later on, as it gets cooler, it will be fuel assistance. Um, it's really those primary areas that we um, assist with, um, and we don't know at this point what to expect, quite frankly, as far as the eviction situation is concerned. Um, we, we really, uh, as I mentioned in my, in my email this morning, we've had some evictions that occurred even uh, it, 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 despite the um, moratoriums that were in place. Um, and with the lifting of the moratorium, I, I, imagine there will be additional evictions, but uh, we just don't know at this point what what direction that's going to go. Um, have you had many people you've referred elsewhere for like the uh, Unite CT? Um, have you, I'm, you know, we're hearing that's not being utilized a lot yet. I'd like to hear what Representative Conley has to say. I know the mayor had heard something about that it might be a difficult process to apply for. It is, it is somewhat difficult. Um, you do need um, to access a computer. Um, the, the state, we did have the, the Unite CT bus come to our building, Human Services, on two occasions and had very few people show up um, to utilize that, that service. And I believe the same situation occurred at Brand at um, St. John's Christian Church when the bus went there as well. And 
in speaking to others around the state, the, the turnout has not been great um, when the bus has gone to various locations throughout the state. And I partly there has been frustration with uh, the fact that landlords are not necessarily cooperating. And the original idea was that, or the, the requirement was that a landlord needed to um, be a, a co, basically a co-applicant with, with the tenant. Um, and landlords were not necessarily um, willing to do that. So for a variety of reasons. Um, so I don't, I think there've been perhaps 2000 some odd applications now statewide, which is really quite, quite small in number. Mayor Hendrick, did you want to add something? Yes, about the United CT. Uh, when, when we had the van come to the municipal building and we had, I think, three or four applicants and I went in to, to see if I can get an understanding of the process. And first of all, it's onerous. Second of all, either they bring the computer to you with a, with a mobile van or you do have to enter everything in on a computer. They don't take it any other way. But we had a very low turnout there. And then the, I think two times we did it down at St. John's with an intent to focus on the areas around uh, that area that we had a very low turnout, even though we advertise it and we put out bilingual communication to uh, draw attention to it, we still had a very low turnout on that. So that's, that's one of the challenges that we're having in the city is even when you're taking things to the populations, sometimes they're not taking advantage of it. And uh, even when you have bilingual communications to get the information out there and you have bilingual speakers there, we still have some challenges. So we're still gonna continue to do it. We're still gonna knock on the doors, but uh, the challenges are still out there. Representative Conley, is there any any um, movement at the state to perhaps change this application structure or, or make improvements so that more people would have access? So that I, their state representatives or senators don't do the applications or, or set the regulations for that. So unfortunately, I can't answer that question. What our staff and what we can do is we can help people who are having troubles um, with the process. And if folks, we've been helping uh, landlords and tenants because there is a section for both the landlord and the tenant. We found a lot of people have completed their end and um, didn't realize that the other end wasn't completed. So we can help with a follow through. Um, we can help folks who don't have computer access. They can talk to our staff members who can type things in for them. Um, we can provide an awful lot of assistance. It's a great program, money's available, but we cannot bring it to anyone um, who doesn't you know, doesn't want to be there. I have an assumption with the evictions moratorium, folks will be at a place where um, they will be at, at housing court. And with this program available, I think they'll be more applicant as people are brought into housing court. Thank you. Um, if you if you have any opportunity to convey the um, frustrations that um, have been expressed here this evening with the relatively few number of people using what seems like a very worthwhile program, that would be appreciated. Um, let's see, Councillor, um, who did I see first? I have Eben Baumgartner Bordelon, uh, moderator Eben. Um, I, I was just gonna say my husband is a, um, landlord here in Groton and did do the Unite CT and I know it, it was cumbersome um, and it all and uh, but he thought it was great and he wished more people knew about it so I don't know if the issue is more on the landlord side for communication um, but but uh, he he did do that and um, I do believe that the landlord uh, does forgive a certain amount of the rent as part of the agreement so that they are like kind of subsidizing that that rent it doesn't pay a hundred percent that's all I had to say. Thank you. Um, Councilor Baumgartner. Yeah, and if there's any way, maybe we can get some data from the state as to how many um, families or individuals within Groton have utilized the program so far as part of that ask. Thank you. 
Um, Councillor Obrey, um, I see your note that you have to leave. Thank you for joining us and uh, stay tuned for notice of next meetings. Um, Councillor Bumgardner, you were asking that of Representative Conley or Director Fondoulis? Um, in, in terms of, actually, yes, um, you know, maybe for Representative Conley or if, um, you know, uh, Ms. Fondoulis will have any discussion with the state um, about the program moving forward, you know, just to see how many folks within the town ha as a whole have utilized the program so far. Thank you. Um, and Councillor Bordelon. Councillor Bordelon, I see your hand. I'm not sure if you wish to speak. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I was just wanted to add a question for uh, Mrs. Fondoulis. Um, has there been any help where folks or residents had come in and maybe um, you might help with the landlord part for them um, since it's very encumbersome? Um, some people may, you know, have never had to do like this kind of ask and maybe having some other person to help with that application part. Is there a need there at all? Um, yes, there is a need. And what we have been doing, um, we're not administering the program directly in the department. So um, what we are doing is referring people to, um, in particular, the New London Homeless Hospitality Center has staff there that can help with the application process. Um, and um, because, and that seems to work better as far as people getting direct help. Um, there's another site too that I'm forgetting now where they where we're referring them, but I know New London Homeless Hospitality Center has staff who actually went and took the the state training and are able to um, help where there when there are roadblocks in the application process. Um, but it it is um, it's very difficult. Um, people tell us that they've tried calling the the numbers that are available. Um, uh, to get direct help um, via telephone from the, from the Unite CT offices. And that is, um, that results in a lot of frustration, unfortunately. So um, we have found it, it, it is most successful if people go directly to um, uh, the Homeless Hospitality Center and talk with staff there. Um, we also, uh, when the bus did come to our building, uh, and to other locations in, in, this, in the town and city, um, we suggested people go directly and talk to the staff on the bus, um, which was also helpful. But it's, it's, it is a, um, so I, yes. I, I guess what I'm seeing as an outlier here in my mind, I guess, is a, a thinking of folks that I know who had to access help during the pandemic that never were in financial need. Um, going to a homeless and hosp hospitality shelter can be a bit much for someone who's never had to step into a place like that, even just to ask for help. And so there could be an embarrassment or a feeling of insecurity um, working with like, like health district with people with food insecurities and, and access to, to, to medical uh, treatment. Um, it would seem to me that some of our funds in this town that we could make sure or look to the state to have train people in our town instead of referring them constantly over the bridge because we do not have a shelter, we do not have a soup kitchen. And so as a town, we, we lack a lot of those fundamental support services that people needed in, in a COVID crisis. And so we're looking at funding that we can use in our town to help our human resource department. To me, it seems as if we should try to find folks, um, even if it's a temporary thing or having some state communication, people that can help in our town where people are becoming possibly almost homeless and losing the, um, their, their places and need these forms filled out. Um, it could be a barrier of trying to get to New London um, and going to a homeless and hospitality place could be very foreign to some folks who've never had to access this. So when we, we talk about the need and needing the boots on the ground and the funding ready, this is an area I think of concern that was addressed tonight. And I think this is an area where we, you, we, we all acknowledge that the form is, is, is cumbersome and I would love to see more support in our town where folks don't have to leave our town that are becoming possibly homeless within the confines of our own town instead of referring them over to New London. 
So those are things I'd like to see and to speak on, on behalf of what you stated earlier, you're just waiting for the direction, the funds. I'm interested to see, and I, as more discussion goes on, what percent of the fund from the state will actually go into human services where it most directly impacts um, our, our residents and our constituents at large, um, making sure that they um, are getting the services they need. This pandemic has addressed the social inequalities. Definitely black and brown folks were at a high level of impact on these, um, not only academically, um, you know, job-wise, they were frontline workers, medically, they were the ones getting sick at higher rates and becoming homeless. And so I really think we need to bring the right people around the table. And I look forward to these discussions to make sure we have that representation, maybe from the NAACP, the state constituents, um, all different areas and sectors of our town to make sure we're addressing the needs of our community. And um, I think we need to figure out a way to stop sending folks across the bridge and, and, and start implementing some services on our side. Thank you. Representative Conley. I should be getting better at this. I just <laughs> wanted to, um, Emily, the assistant for Joe and I, I emailed her and she got back to me and she's already said, um, some of the issues she's been having with calls is that when people apply or if they go to the vans or when they go to apply, they do need a lot of documentation. They need copies of their lease. They need copies of past due rent and they need verification of whatever income that they do have, which could be a snap on their phone of unemployment income or if working part-time, they need copies of the checks. So if the vans are coming around again in the advertisement, it's important that folks know what to bring so that you're not uh, having people show up at the vans or show up to apply and then having to go home, get more documents, come back, because it, the doc, you do have to prove the income and prove the debt owed both on the landlord side and the tenant side. Um, so if you want, I'll snap in the chat the um, what people need, if people can snap that back to their um, computers for the advertisements. Thank you, that will be helpful. All right, um, I'm, I don't have control of the hand, so Councilor Bordelon, I don't know if this is new or if this is left from your last comment. Um, yeah, no, I just had one more thing that I apologize. I'm just looking at some notes from Ledger Lake Health and some other meetings I was in um, it would seem to me that this town could use and over the next three years a, a, a social navigator to help folks with these forms and any other programs. It just feels very overwhelming and frustrating to me um, to think that folks aren't getting the access because they're just not able to do that, right? And so it would be really helpful to think about having somebody on our staff that is temporary while we, we work through this process to um, help these folks on our side of the bridge with these forms, let it be for school programs, let it be for social service programs, helping them navigate these forms. Sometimes it might be lending the hand and making a phone call to the landlord for them and saying, hey, we have the form here. This is what they're trying to do. And this is you know, helping them to explain. It can be very overwhelming to advocate for yourself when you're feeling the pressure and need financially. And so I would love to see some funds like this all allocated to help at the ground level, maybe shared between the city and the town and maybe even the board of ed to help folks be able to be able to help themselves fill these forms out and get access. Thank you. All right, we are on to um, four four. Uh, COVID-19 updates. Mr. Bird, I'm assuming this is you since you usually provide them for us. Well, usually at this, we kind of go around, but I think we've pretty much covered everything um, other than I was excited to this last uh, report on COVID, the last two week report, there was no new cases in Groton. So that was great. Hopefully that continues on. And I totally 100% agree with Councillor Bordelon about the need to have a staff person to help guide people through using these funds. Uh, or using these programs because we don't we don't want to establish programs and then have very few people take advantage of them that that would not look good so i think that's a key priority i guess what i'm looking for is once you set the next meeting but is there a particular items staff should be working on um if well Paige, did you have something do you want to say something before we get some direction no i'll wait till you finish john okay. thank you so just wondering, is there certain things we should be working on before the next meeting? Well, my question was going to be, we normally do these on a monthly basis, um, but we were kind of waiting to see where we were with funding. Now that we have some sense of funding, do we want to meet 
um, in a time period closer than one month out? Do you want to come back in a couple of weeks or does staff need time to um, work up proposals? I'm not quite sure. Um, it kind of what, depends on what you're looking for us to do. I mean, we don't really have any set direction at this point, but yeah, I do agree we need to, to meet more, whether it's figuring out the direction or implementing anything. Okay, well, do you wanna say we can we can take two weeks and everyone can kind of brainstorm with their appropriate bodies. We can come back in two weeks and meet again. And at that point, we can make some decisions about what we would like staff to do. Would that work, Mr. Burt? Yes. Okay, so what does that do as far as date? Um, let's see, that puts us in July. What day? I just had a quick clarifying question when you one have a minute. Moment, please, one moment, please. Um, so if we go two weeks, that would put us on the 14th, Bastille Day. Um, would Bastille Day work for everyone? <laughs> July 14th? Mr. Burt, uh, you, uh, Mayor Hedrick, and um, Dr. Piazza, would that date work? Oh. One second. We'll Moderator the Evan, is that your, that's your RTM though, correct? It is, but we were, we were actually, I was just asked, uh, I don't think we have anything on our agenda at this moment. Oh, okay. So we were thinking of canceling it. Okay. So then could, do you want to say the 14th? That works for me then too. That works for me. Okay. So yeah. we'll say our next meeting will be July 14th. At uh, what time? Uh, 5.30, please. We try to, we normally do these in an hour, but we had so much information tonight that it, it's taken, we follow the Harry Watson rule, Dr. Ackerman, um, but it's taken a little bit longer uh, tonight because we had so much information to disseminate because everything's kind of happening now at once. Um, so if everyone talks to the respective bodies and um, kind of gleans where you want to go or if you have ideas then we could report back at that meeting and then we'll go from there but mr bronk was waiting to say something mr bronk uh it's just kind of a miscellaneous comment uh i'm kind of intrigued by the coordinator concept that was mentioned maybe a social coordinator uh our department we we deal with um fair rent commission we're getting a lot getting an uptick in uh, inquiries and, and applications to go before that uh, that board. Also, we do have um, a housing rehab program. We honestly have not been promoting it over the past few years because we, we don't have any money. Um, and uh, we have a waiting list. That program is basically CDBG funding has a lot of strings, lot, a lot of bureaucracy attached to it. And I wasn't planning on getting on tonight's meeting to tout any particular project, but we continue to talk about housing and social services. And I, I think we have a need, I know there's a need in Groton for housing rehab and particularly those who don't know how to easily go through the process. So I'm more than happy to talk about housing rehab later and possibly Maybe that's a project for us, but I think I just wanted to simply say that um, I know there are people who would benefit from a little more direct assistance with some of these programs. Maybe that's something you could talk to us about in two weeks then and fill us in on a little bit of the, are you talking about ECHO? Is that what it is? The uh, No, it's actually the, the town of Groton's um, housing rehab program. It's uh, within our department. Great. And we have an application, people apply. We typically will um, have funds ranging from 15 to 30,000 for you know roof, interior work, heating, things like that. Uh, we have a waiting list and we don't have enough money to satisfy it. Okay, great. That sounds like something we should take another look at. Thank you for mentioning it. Moderator Eben. Thank you. Um, I uh, was just interested in the last bin that uh, Mr. Bronk mentioned, which was sewer and stormwater uh, infrastructure. And I know that with the uh, Clean Water Act MS4 um, requirements coming online now, there are a lot more um, uh, you know, uh, requirements of the town. And I, I, you know, I like the idea to some extent of you know, having value added projects that, that meet a lot of needs. And the thing about stormwater is it will meet 
you know, our needs for clean water, but it will also make us a much more resilient community in terms of climate change. So what I would like to know at our next meeting is, you know, what kinds of requirements do we have kind of coming online in this MS4 range that, that maybe some of this funding from what you said might be able to be mobilized. I don't know if someone from Public Works could tell us um, if that's the right um, bailiwick for that, um, but, but that would be good. It's something I know uh, in my own work we've been discussing is the new MS4 requirements. So that would be great. I'll check okay. with, uh, I'll check on that. Great. Thank you. Mr. Hanover and, and perhaps Mayor Hedrick could also, I'm, I'm sure you have your own MS4 requirements that you're dealing with, so. We do, and the state requirements, I mean, they increase every year. We increase some funding this year uh, for some of the requirements. Uh, town increased them last year, and uh, we increased them this year. And, and that's one of the things that, uh, we had a resiliency workshop yesterday, and we talked a little bit about stormwater and sewer and those kind of things. Stormwater's one of the things that, that we are gonna be looking at for the funds. But uh, we also wanna make sure that they go to social programs as well and not everything in the infrastructure. So, but the stormwater drains is something we are looking at closely. Thank you. And Councilor Borland. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to clarify what uh, the town manager Burt had stated. Did he state that he didn't think there was a need for a person no, I to, said I 100% um, agree with you. No, I think oh, there's okay. a definite I didn't, My computer had cut out. Yeah, no, I, okay. don't, I think it's I'm a just thinking need. like, for, <laughs> Yeah, and I think it could be beneficial from a board of ed sector as well. Possibly there could be some collaboration in the town with some of these complex forms. And it could even be, I, I'm looking online and I'm seeing where they're appointing um, part-time folks. I mean, it might be a twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars position for only three years with a short ending, and it could be a contract position where um, these forms they're going to be, you know, versed in these. And when we look at how many millions of dollars we get, it we're getting ninety thousand dollars to facilitate an access um, for these folks is is minimal, and that's the, the direct impact that people are looking for. So I, I'm interested also to speak further and have uh, Mr. Bronk come back with more information regarding the programs that he had mentioned as well. So I'm really intrigued by that. Thank you. All right, Mr. Burt, did you have anything else? I don't. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Thank you. <laughs> Is there a second? Hedrick. Hedrick. By Evan, seconded by Hedrick. All those in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved unanimously. We are adjourned at 7 p.m. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and welcome to Groton, Dr. Piazza. Yeah.